Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope everybody is doing well and everyone had a great New Year's Eve. It's actually the 31st of December 2020, so we're all hoping to send off this year. And uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Canto number 8 of the Divine Comedy of Inferno to follow um, on this series of uh, comments and thoughts about uh, Dante's Cantos. Canto 8 is a little bit of a strange canto. It's, uh, it's extremely cinematic. It's uh, a canto where that could be translated into um, an episode of a TV series, let's say, because so much happens. Uh, somebody even said too much happens, but uh, I don't think so. I think it's really a dynamic canto where there is a lot of action, a lot of action scenes, and it's uh, even more, I think, um, apt to compare it with almost an action movie because it ends, at the end of the canto, it ends with a, a immediate rest, so with suspense. Canto 8 is also um, following an unusual complex narrative, and this narrative uh, has started at the end of canto number 7, with uh, the Pilgrim and Virgil look, seeing a tower, in the darkness uh, along the river Styx and uh, this narrative arc is going to complete or conclude partially in uh, canto number nine. The canto starts with uh, a line that has been debated just uh, as usual with the Divine Comedy and uh, many believe that uh, this uh, continuing word in the very first line, continuing I tell how for some time, which in Italian is io dico seguitando, cassai prima. This seguitando is a verb that Dante didn't need to insert in the, in the narration or in this poem, uh, and that hints at the fact that the first part of the, of the Inferno, the first seven cantos, had been written by him in a, at an earlier time, um, and then, according to Boccaccio, this, uh, these writings were actually found while Dante was already in exile, after 1301. And then, in some, in some way, they were delivered to Dante with the request from uh, many people, including the landowner that, landed, that Dante was staying at, uh, to continue with this project. However, I've also read a lot of people who completely disagree with this theory and so there are pros and cons on both sides. One of the uh, arguments pro is that uh, stylistically uh, canto number eight uh, has been considered to be a little bit more mature and all the rest of the Inferno and, and the Divine Comedy than the first seven cantos but like many other things in the Divine Comedy it remains a complete mystery. The canto starts with a flashback. This is um, already something peculiar and that gives us a little bit of narrative traction. A flashback where um, Dante says, for some time, for a long time in a certain sense, before we reached the lofty tower, tower's base, our eyes were following two points of flame visible at the top and answering these another return of the signal. So far away, the eye could barely catch it. So Dante is telling us that he's already close to a certain, a certain location, but before uh, reaching this tower, he's been seeing this back and forth between lights, and these lights are little flames um, switched on and off by the devils who are guarding the city of this uh, to communicate to each other that somebody is coming. In this particular canto, the relationship between Dante and Virgil develops even further in very interesting ways. We'll see. I turn to face my sea of knowledge. Sea of knowledge. Uh, this in Italian is rendered as uh, al mar di tutto il senno. The sea of all, not only knowledge, but senno as uh, wisdom as well. Knowledge, wisdom. We know that Virgil represents reason in the Divine Comedy. My sea of knowledge and said, O oh Master, say, what does this beacon mean? 
and the other fire? What answer does the signal and who are they? Who said it there? He, uh, Dante is very anxious here. And he said, it should be clear, over these fetid waves, you can perceive what is expected if this atmosphere of marsh fumes doesn't hide it. Bow never draw, and all of a sudden, from the distance, they see uh, a boat, a little boat approaching them, but at an incredible and uh, um, impossible, physically impossible speed. Bow never drove arrow through air so quickly and then came skimming across the water a little skiff guided by a single boatman at the helm. A single boatman, uh, Dante calls that um, un sol galeotto. Uh, a single soul, it's correct, it's a correct translation, but it also means uh, lonely. And, uh, and this, again, um, is uh, giving us the dynamism of, of the canto. There is action, there's something happening, and it's pretty horrific. Now, we know that this boatman is Phlegius. And to make a general, a very general comment, within the entire Divine Comedy there are, we, we're gonna find in total three boatmen. One we already met, which is Charon, one is Phlegius, and the third one will be um, an angel guiding a boat uh, in, at the beginning of Purgatory. So this, uh, this boatman, Phlegius, um, speaks to Virgil, cries out to Virgil as, uh, as soon as he gets there next to Dante Virgil. Now, evil soul, he calls Virgil evil soul because it takes him for any of the condemned souls around there. Uh, you are caught. And uh, uh, this tell explains to us why around Phlegius there's no other condemned souls, just like, uh, for example, with Charon. Phlegius's role is not, that, is not similar to Charon. Phlegius is not a double, a second Charon. He is uh, uh, mastering this boat on the Styx River, not to uh, transport all the damned souls. In fact, we know that the damned soul, condemned souls are sent from Minos directly to their circle in hell, wherever they belong. So they don't need to go through Phlegius. But his role here is to patrol the dirty waters of the Styx and make sure that the souls of the wrathful and the sullen, because we are still in uh, circle five, in the fifth circle, do not escape and remain within the marsh, within the, the sticks. So he is thinking that Virgil has gotten out of the sticks and he wants to get, get back. Now Virgil replies, Phlegius, Phlegius, your roar in vain this time. Uh, you'll have us in your boat only as long as it takes to cross the fen. One quick comment about uh, uh, the identity of uh, Phlegius. Phlegius was the, in mythology, the son of god Mars. Uh, he had burned Apollo's temple in Delphi, um, and then he was thrown into Tartarus, uh, swearing an angry revenge. So the story itself of Phlegius has to do with the wrathful in one way or the other with this uh, concept of anger and uh, uh, with reflections around anger. Then the canto continues with uh, another very dynamic and very um, cinematic scene where we can see that uh, Virgil steps in the boat and the boat is there simply bobbing on uh, the dirty water of sticks, nothing really changes. And only when Dante steps in the boat, it does uh, rock because Dante is the only one with a, a physical weight. Uh, this is a detail, but uh, it adds um, action and uh, drama to, to the scene. So the boat leaves and he made a deeper cut into the water that he was one to do with others. In that channel, one rose all of a sudden, all of a sudden somebody um, rose a beam coated with mud, completely covered in mud, somebody jumps out of the dirty water. Again, we are looking at almost a, a, a nightmarish vision and addresses Dante in particular. Who are you to come here before your time? And I to him, Dante's reply to him is, uh, is very important. Although I come, I do not come to remain. Then added, who are you who have become so brutally foul? You see me, 
replies this soul, I am one who weeps. Very general and vague uh, identification, he answered. And I to him, in weeping and sorrow remain, cursed soul, for I have seen through all that filth, I know you. Here we start feeling a little bit of the strangeness of this canto, how so far we've been used to Dante being really compassionate and moved and having pity for all the condemned souls that he met from Francesca to Chaco, etc. Um, here it's almost the opposite. He is uh, uh, actually referring to this soul that we don't, we still don't know who this is, with an aggressive demeanor and attitude and he says in weeping and sorrow remain cursed soul for i have seen through all that filth i know you behind all that um, mud mask that you have on your face i can see who you are i recognized you and i understand that you need to you deserve to be there we could compare almost this portion of this scene to a scene of a of a horror movie of a modern 20th century horror movie this uh, man from the dirty waters started gripping with both hands at the boat. The master Virgil stood and thrust him back off, saying, back to safe keeping among the other dogs. And then Virgil embraced Dante's neck and kissed him on the face and said, indignant soul, blessed indeed is she who bore you. Isn't this a really strange scene overall given what we've read so far in the other cantos. It's strange because of Dante's behavior. It's uh, strange because of, because of Virgil's behavior as well. Um, Virgil goes, we, can, we could say, over the top in uh, uh, hugging and kissing Dante with this uh, uh, expression of love. So what has happened? Something must have, must have happened that is very important. And as usual with Dante, it must have different layers of meaning. One of these uh, meanings is pretty literal and historic. Uh, Dante has recognized a specific person, an individual, who we know because he names him later, Filippo Argenti. Filippo Argenti was uh, a member of the family of the Adimari in Florence. They were absolutely hated and despised by Dante for many different reasons. They were Filippo Argenti in particular was a violent guy, very arrogant. He was called Argenti because Argento means uh, silver and he had gained this, earned this nickname because he used to, he used to use silver to actually um, decorate his uh, horse. All the features and equipments that he used as a knight were made in silver, which was uncommon. And in addition, there are uh, reasons to believe that uh, this uh, Filippo Argenti was the brother of uh, the person who, as soon as Dante was sent in exile, uh, appropriated uh, Dante's goods. So his family, this uh, Adimari, were partially responsible for exiling the uh, white Cherokee, including Dante, uh, and there was this history. It's obvious that Dante had a lot of uh, um, bad feelings for the family and in particular for this guy. The second layer that we can use to, we can look at to read this uh, strange reaction from Dante is uh, the spiritual one and that's uh, really um, referred according to some uh, critics to the concept of righteous anger. Going back to Aristoteles, Dante is really referring here to um, the type of righteous anger that was that virtuous midpoint in between um, wrath, uh, terrible wrath, and uh, um, a, a, a solemn type of attitude. Aristoteles had uh, theorized that righteous anger was in the perfect middle, where virtue was in between this type of uh, um, behaviors and attitudes on how to manage anger. This can be interpreted as a step forward in his spiritual journey because this type of uh, response that Dante is having to Filippo Argenti is spiritually and psychologically as well something to be praised. This is in part the reason why Virgil praises his response so much and praises him 
um, even if in this over-the-top way, where he says, in indignant soul, blessed indeed is she who bore you. This is a very uh, clear uh, quote from the Gospel, from Luke Gospel, and the word indignant in, in uh, Italian is sdegnosa, is specifically repeated in the next canto, in Canto 9, um, about uh, the angel who comes to save Dante and Virgilio and to help Dante and Virgilio. Uh, in other words, it's a word that means uh, to be uh, righteously angry, righteously indignant. Uh, therefore, there is nothing spiritually wrong with taking this type of stance. The defects in love are those ones that are less pitiable than excesses of love. This is also part of the hierarchy of sins. As we can see, all the sins that we have been uh, examining so far are sins that have to do with our, our almost beastly nature. When uh, we, when the our instincts prevail, we sin in this in this way, and then there is a certain measure that we can try to find. But the next ones inside. The sins punished inside the city of this um, are much more human sins in the sense that they require um, thought, they require reason, and they require all that the animals don't have and that we human beings have. For example, fraud is a perfect example, or heresy, betrayal, all those things. Dante has a really odd request, which is, Master, truly I should like to see the spirit pickled in this swill before we made our way across the lake. It's, uh, it, it makes you wonder. The first time that I read this, I had to take a second step and say, is he really asking Virgil to please let him admire Filippo Argenti suffering in the mud? Uh, that's exactly what he's asking. <laughs> so he's asking him, please, um, it's my wish that before we get to the other side, uh, I see this guy suffer a lot in, in his uh, punishment. Virgil says, before we see the shore, you will be satisfied, for what you seek is fitting. Again, very probably referring to the fact that this righteous anger is justified. It's the right thing to feel for Dante in this, in this moment. After a little, I saw him, Filippo Argenti, endure fierce mangling by the people of the mud, a sight I give God thanks and praises for. Dante is very happy. He is uh, very happy because he's seen Filippo Argenti being mangled by the, by the people in the mud. And these people in the mud, other condemned souls, were actually screaming at him. Come get Filippo Argenti, they all cried. Uh, and crazed with rage, the Florentine spirit bit at his own body. This is such a strong image. A strong image from a that reminds me of these black and white horror movies from the 30s. He's so angry that he doesn't know what to do. He actually bites himself on, a, on an arm or, or, a, or a hand. Let no more be said of him, but that we left him still beset. Now, the, comp the description of the city of this is really uh, peculiar. And again, from a design point of view, uh, really nightmarish and horrific. He can see mosques. Now, this is clearly a reference to Islam, to Islamic uh, worship buildings. When he says uh, mesquite, e io maestro già le sue mesquite in Italian, he actually is referring specifically to the uh, minarets, the towers uh, of the mosques, because from the distance, that's what he could see um, of, of, of those buildings. And they are red. They are red because of the fire, light, or they're just baked red. I would love to deepen my knowledge of, of that period. I know that uh, the Islamic Golden Age was declining, probably around uh, uh, 1200, 1300, and that in Spain in particular, there had already been harsh conflicts between Christians and uh, Muslims. But uh, but this is uh, certainly a negative thing that, that recalls the fact, that refers um, to the fact that later on, deeper in hell, we are actually going to find Muhammad. Above the gates, I saw more than a thousand of those 
whom heaven had spat like rain, all raging. We should imagine this again in a cinematic way because uh, he says more than a thousand, and that's uh, to say uh, an immense number of devils. These are real devils that uh, are not taken from classical mythology, but uh, they're much more peculiar to the Christian visual history. And uh, more than a thousand getting there, uh, confronting Dante and Virgil. So his fear is really growing at this point. And let's remember, Dante has been uh, uh, terrified from the very beginning of, uh, of this book, basically. These devils start uh, shouting, who is this who'd go without death through the kingdom of, de of the dead? And my wise master made a sign to show that he desired to speak with them aside. And then they tempered the, their great disdain a bit, answering, you, by yourself, may come inside, but let the other depart who dare set foot within this kingdom. Let him retrace along his foolish way, try if he can. The scene, again, it's a very dynamic one because we have Dante scared of, of all these devils that are coming there. Um, Virgil is trying to reassure him and say, I'm going to take care of this. In fact, they're hoping to use the usual formula, volsi così colà, and just be allowed to go on. But at, at first, the first thing that the devils uh, are saying to them is, to Virgil, is, okay, you can come here and speak to me, to us, but the other one, who's Dante, we don't like him here because he's, uh, he's not dead. So he should turn around and go back up and exit uh, hell all by himself. Um, and so we can imagine how more than terrified at this point uh, Dante is. This is why, for the first time, Dante uh, blurts out with uh, um, even breaking the fourth wall, which is something that was not common at all in uh, literature in, in those times, and he goes, you judge, O reader, if I did not lose heart or believe then, hearing the cursed voice that I would never return from there. Uh, and this is why, in a slightly cowardly way, the first thing that he that Dante says to Virgil is, okay, well, things are not looking great, so I have an, a great idea. Why don't we go back? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, we've seen enough. I'm, I'm glad I have a lot of things to write. Let's just go back. But uh, Virgil says, do not fear. He still tries to reassure him. Uh, None can be deprive us of the passage that God has willed for us to live. So Virgil goes away and uh, leaves me, Dante, the gentle father, uh, while I remain in doubt, with yes and no vying in my head. This is a really beautiful expression, uh, the way Dante writes it. Io rimagno in forse, che si e non il capo mi tenciona. I had this yes and no bouncing around in my head, in my skull, with yes and no vying in my head. Um, what they discussed together, or what my guy proposed, Virgil and the, group, the bunch of uh, devils, I don't know. But uh, before much time, the demons scrambled back where, where we would go. And then I saw our adversaries, the demons, um, slam the portals of the entrance in the face of my master, who remained outside and came back to me walking slowly with downcast eyes, his brow devoid of confidence. And he said, who has denied me all this abode of sighs? Basically, Virgil didn't, um, his, mis his uh, strategy didn't work out. He said to Dante, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to talk with these violent people. And, uh, and now he's walking back very uh, disappointed that it didn't work out. He might have even uh, tried to use his wall civil così colà, but the devils didn't care. And uh, they are not letting him through. However, Virgil also says that this insolence of theirs is nothing new. Um, it's something they tried and they shown even when uh, uh, Jesus Christ came to hell to pick up some of the souls, as we as we saw in, uh, in Canto number four. And here, the great moment of suspense of this uh, episode, if we want to call it, already on this side of it, down the steep pass, passing the circles without an escort. Is somebody coming down into hell 
someone is coming to open the city to us. Here there is a couple of uh, things that I would like to simply, simply highlight. One is, uh, as I said in the beginning, the type of uh, action and, and the dynamic rendition of this uh, canto is marvelous. It's, you know, if, if a really good director could make it into a TV episode or something like that, it would be an incredibly engaging and gripping thing to see. If we think about uh, uh, canto number one, for example, um, from a visual point of view, the, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about canto one, with all those allegories, etc., is a medieval uh, painting or a medieval representation, maybe even one of those church representations with stiff characters, no sense of depth at all, and uh, purely figures that mean something as allegories. But if I look at, if I read this canto, the jump in time and in, in level of modernity is incredible. I mean, this could be, as I said, the script for a modern 20th century horror movie. And it would be a really good one. So we end this canto with a great suspense. Um, the second comment I wanted to make is about uh, uh, Virgil. Uh, Virgil has been almost invincible so far in the first seven cantos, almost like a superhero. Nobody can stop him, he says little formulas, and all the monsters just let him through. There is something to say about the fact that these monsters, until now, the demons, all came from uh, classic mythology, and so they were kind of part of his world, part of Virgil's world, while here he's dealing with uh, uh, actual devils who are protecting this, the city of this. The first installment of Dante's, of the plot that Dante is creating to undermine his authority, to undermine Virgil's authority, more and more, almost like a a gradual loss of authority until the end of purgatory where Virgil will need to leave and uh, pass the baton to somebody else. There is, as always with Dante, a spiritual meaning to this. Human reason by itself cannot prevail over evil without God's help. This is really where Dante is getting at, what Dante is getting at. This means that as important as, re as reason is, which is extremely important, it, it needs to participate with God's wisdom and with God's plan uh, in order to um, conquer evil and to, to beat evil. By himself, Virgil is not able to accomplish this mission. And in uh, other cantos in the future, uh, in future cantos, we'll, we'll following cantos, we'll see that uh, this will happen again. Um, the limitations of Virgil as a character will be um, very clear and uh, heavier and heavier. Thank you very much for watching. This was canto number eight of Inferno and uh, if you're interested in following the next videos please subscribe and if you have any question let me know. I'll try to to maybe do some research and be able to address them. Um, other than that it's uh, 2020 is gonna be finished tonight. So again, I wish you a very good and very happy new year.